Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Carlton People. This one's been one in the making for a while. I've been very excited to uh, do this chat and have a chat to someone who you will all recognize. Uh, he's the host of the My Blue Heaven YouTube channel. He does a whole bunch of great stuff for us Carlton people in the fan media space. I talk of none other than Mr. Heath Buck. G'day, Bucky. G'day, Terry. Terry, thanks for having me, mate. Such a nice uh, introduction there. I really appreciate that. Uh, no worries. It was. Uh, I remember um, you sent a text just before, or just at the start of this, uh, yeah. this break that we had, and um, <laughs> we were looking forward to sort of catching up and and doing a, a face to face or an in person uh, video. Um, this will do for now, but I'm sure there'll be times where we're at a game or whatnot where we can do this in person. Oh, definitely. I reckon we've been trying to do this for about six months, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Uh, we often catch up at training and. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be on, mate. I've been watching quite a few of these uh, little episodes of Carlton People. They're absolutely brilliant, so well done. Thank you, mate. No, it's good. It's good to get a, a wide range of, of Carlton stories. I mean, they're all very similar in, in the passion and, and, and whatnot, but everyone has different memories and different games that stick out to them. Um, and so, obviously, the purpose of this is to really dive into your story and, and, yeah. and what makes you a Carlton person. Um, mate, take the floor. Tell us a little bit about where it all began for you. Oh, well, um, I'm a first-generation Australian, um, so mum and dad are both uh, immigrants. Um, dad came across from the UK, and he's Welsh, um, and mum's a, a Kiwi. So um, they came here in the late 60s. Uh, dad was over actually here in Australia in the mid-50s for a short period of time um, and had a liking... He worked in uh, Melbourne's West in a, in a meat factory and had a liking for uh, North Melbourne, um, the shin boners. And uh, so he went and watched a few games in the mid-50s, went back home to the UK and then met my mum in his travels and then they hooked up in New Zealand and then decided to come across to Australia for better opportunities. But by that stage, my mum had been following the Carlton results in the paper in New Zealand and she loved the colours of the navy blue because it reminded her of her, her dad. He played rugby union and they were the navy blue as well. So she was already barracking for Carlton when she was in New Zealand, but just through following the scores, nothing else. And at that time, so I think she was telling me in about 65, 66, Carlton were actually not sort of mid-table. They weren't a very successful team at that stage. And then they came over in 67 to Australia um, and I was born and I took a lot of brothers who were born in New Zealand and dad said, I'll take you to a game. I'll take you to a North, we'll go to see North Melbourne and Carlton play. So the deal was, and it was 1970, the deal was whoever won that game, that's who the whole family would barrack for. And it was at Arden Street, Carlton versus North Melbourne at Arden Street. And obviously 1970, Carlton were very strong. They won the grand final in 1970 and, and Carlton wiped North Melbourne's butt. And so, yeah, and mum fell in love with Alex Jezelinko as well. So it's been Carlton ever since. And dad became a, a, a passionate Carlton supporter. And I was speaking to mum yesterday. This year is 48 years consecutive member. So she's wow. two years away, mate, from um, from being a 50-year member, which is quite outstanding. Dad passed away 18 months ago, so he would have been in the same boat. Um, but, yeah, look, it's just, I mean... <laughs> Like any young kid in the 1970s, um, I went to my first game in 71 as, a, as an 18-month-year-old, two, two years old I was. Uh, went to the 72 grand final, 73 grand final. We missed out on 79. We couldn't get tickets. Went in 81, 82. Um, I went in the losing one in 86, 87. Didn't go in 95. Um, but, yeah, look, it's just been a – look – we grew up on the terraces of Princess Park, and I've, I've explained this to you before. Like, every Saturday afternoon, we were either at Princess Park, and in a way, we were down at Cadinia Park or, or Arden Street or Victoria Park. And we, drew up, we, we grew up standing in the outer every weekend. It was just like, it was like going to church, mate. So our family was just obsessed by the Carlton Football Club um, right the way through that period, and, and they still are now. You know, my mum still goes every week, um, you know, my, my kids now follow Carlton. So everyone in the family is Carlton. It's, yeah, it's, it's in the blood, mate. So it's, that's yeah. so good. That's, that's, yeah. I, I didn't know that, uh, I didn't know that about your family. I didn't know uh, the history behind you there. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, both. I mean, when you come to a new country, you know, and mum and dad both love their sport. And dad obviously followed soccer in the UK. He's an Arsenal supporter, and um, good yeah, good man. Um, yeah, and he, he, I wouldn't say he loved his soccer. He was looking for something else. Um, he was looking, I suppose, for a more aggressive game. Um, and he fell in love with Australian rules football. I mean, he by the time he, I mean, he was an expert. Never played the game, but he, he was an expert on the game. Um, and mum, mum's just so passionate about it. She's one of the most passionate supporters. Stubborn. She was she'd be going to the games in the end by herself when we were when we were finishing on the bottom of the ladder. She'd go every week, uh, just blindly go into the outer and whinge and whine about it and. Uh, Savor the small little moments, mate, that we may have, you know, had a few wins here and there. But, geez, it's been miserable, hasn't it, for a long period of time? Yeah, no, it sure has. And I really look forward to chatting to people like yourself, um, John Allen as well. You know, people who have lived through and seen the golden era. Because for someone yeah. like me, I just get the stories sort of passed down to me, you know? Yeah, well, it's funny that because, I, I mean, I, I was a... a I mean, I was a kid in 79. I can't remember 70. I mean, I was there in 72 when we won, but I can't remember any of it. I was just too young. Yeah. Um, and I, was, I can vaguely remember 73. I can vaguely remember going, but we got beaten by Richmond. But I can't remember the result, but I distinctly remember 79. Um, you know, I, I've just got fond memories of 79. It was a massive crowd. Mum had lined up. She'd taken time off work to line up to get the tickets at Princess Park. And she got, the lines were unbelievable. She got within oh, about 10 metres of the of the ticket box there. You know, the, the main entrance at Princess Park, it's still there now, now yeah. just under the Hawthorne stand. Mm -hmm. And they closed the door, said no more tickets left. And in those days, unless you were a social club member, you weren't guaranteed tickets. Just normal members like we were, you had to line up. You basically had to line up. So from then on, 81 and 82, we actually slept out. We actually slept out at the ground at wow. Princess Park, lined the chairs up. And a lot of other people have similar memories and we're able to score tickets that way. So 81, we stood at the at the, uh, the punt road end. We actually stood in the standing room. They were the only tickets we could get. And then 82, we were in the southern stand, mid-deck. And that was probably my fondest memory, mm -hmm. um, that game, because it was such an aggressive game against Richmond. Um, they were a very powerful team. They beaten us in the finals. We came back, had a hard-fought victory against Hawthorne in the prelim, and it was a quite a. It was that was the day of the streaker, the um, the streaker, um, and Richmond had got out to a bit of a lead, and we fought back, and and they'd knocked Kenny Hunter out. He got back up. It was a really vicious game, and then Alex Marku sort of sealed it late for us. It was unbelievable, and that was the that was the back end of the three premierships in four years, and that for me was. That was the, the sweet spot for me um, because as I got a little bit older, um, up around into the mid-80s, I started playing football myself. So I didn't so much drift away from the club, but I drifted away from actually attending games because I was playing football every Saturday. Um, and it wasn't until I probably finished playing football myself, which <laughs> it wasn't that long ago that I've become, I've got that obsession back, which I had as a kid. So there it goes, you know. Like there was a long period of time where, like even 95, I was following Carlton, but I wasn't as obsessed about it as I now. It's funny when you're playing football yourself, you, you go to the games and you you miss out on all that, you know, because basically mid-90s, it was mostly Saturday afternoons and a few Sunday games, Friday night. Not like the saturation we have football now. I mean, yeah. Carlton can play – we can play every Sunday game this year, I think, and mm. – Late Saturday, so you can you get to go Saturday nights, but back then it was Saturday afternoon or, or some Sunday games. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. What I mean, obviously the game has changed just by virtue of the fact yeah. that society changes and um, commercialization comes into play. Uh, and I did speak to John Johnny Allen about this as well, but I want to get your take. What What's the biggest difference in let's say you know you growing up and when you were watching the footy compared to now? I look. I often say to my kids, I, I actually feel a little bit sorry for, you know, even I'm not quite sure exactly how old you are, Terry, but I I think, and I'm not talking about the game itself because there's a lot yeah. of talk at the moment, mate, so much bullshit about, oh, the game was better in the 90s, oh, you know, this and that. I love the game now. I love it. 
because it changes. The way the game is played changes. And it was always going to change with, you know, when it went professional and you were able to have 55 assistant coaches and game day strategy. So it was always going to change. So I still love the game now, kicking backwards, short kicks, you know, zones. That doesn't bother me. But the game, as I remember it growing up, was so pure for a kid. I, I, I just that that's all we had, mate. So it was. I'd get home from school. There was not that we had a TV, but there was three channels. So the last thing you would have done when you got home from school when I was growing up was was turn the TV on. There was no there was no stations or no computer games. It was either grab a football and go outside until the street lights came on, and you go inside for dinner. And then you roll a sock up and kick that around the lounge room. So it was just football, football, football. And I grew up in a period of time where you could go every Saturday. It was like a ritual. You, you went to the suburban grounds. You stood. You could basically stand anywhere. Um, you know, at the MCG, you could walk in on the, the southern stand side wing and, and sit on the wing. Where, you know, you didn't have to have a member. You could just sit anywhere you like. Now, it's it, the actual game day experience now is, is fantastic. It's comfortable but it hasn't got that same feel as it had when I was growing up. And I'm not being reminiscent about that. It's just exactly the way it was, you know, yeah. the, 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 even the smells, you know, and, and, and the people and, the, and, and some things changed for good. I mean, the language at the football when I was growing up was, you know, I mean, you wouldn't want to repeat some of the things that were being said. And some of these things were being said by my own father, mind you. Um, you know, so some of the stuff that you hear in the crowd back then, it was like water off a duck's back. But if you heard it now, um, you can understand that how wrong it was. But at the same time, it just the little things that, you know, with the old scoreboards, you know, with the with the horse races going up, you know, and the and the footy record with the around the ground scores and all those little things that just we miss out on now. The like going home in the car, you turn the radio on the AM radio, and they'd be around the grounds, and they go through every Saturday game. Um, and you'd listen to a little bit of a, a review on every game, and then you get home, there'd be a, a replay on, and then World of Sport in the morning, and then and that was it. You forgot about football until the following Saturday. We just saturated down, mate. It's we just got it in our ears, in our eyes all the time. There's just so much content. It's unbelievable. And yeah, it was one of the reasons. One of the reasons why I, I started up the the My Blue Heaven um, YouTube channels because, um, and, and you're probably similar to yourself, is because I just thought there was probably a lack of of, of Carlton content. I mean, you can, and, and I, I suppose I was probably guilty of, of having a go at journalists who are writing things about Carlton. But you've got to understand that they're they're covering eighteen other clubs. You know, where we we're only covering really one club. Um, so I was having a go at them for, for saying things about Carlton, which I didn't agree with, and, and I thought their tape was shallow. Why not do something about it? Why not put some content out yourself? So that was sort of the reason, um, you know, to, to give people, supporters like ourselves, some content that, that either comes from the heart or either comes from just watching your club so much, going to training, you know, following the players inside and out, you know, whereas the... The mainstream media, they've got so much to cover. They've got 18 other clubs to cover. And that's why you get so defensive sometimes when someone in the media has a has a strong point about Carlton. You seem to jump down their throat, don't you? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> like, I, do, I do anyway. You know what I mean? I, well, I did. Not so much now, but I, I, I was. So I thought, why not put my money where my mouth is and, and have a go myself? Yeah. So no, no, I, yeah. I, I can certainly relate to that. I think um, further to your point, you know, the, the I guess, let's say, probably five or ten years ago, it was almost, the routine was, you know, you watch your games and then you've got to pretty much wait until the paper comes out. You, you might have a, a one-page or a two-page spread, um, you know, AFL 360 on the Monday, then you got on the couch. I mean, and, and like you said, there's 18 clubs. So really, and we're lucky because we're Carlton and we're a big-ish name to talk about. We might get five or six minutes total over those two or three shows on that Monday night, which is great and it's fantastic and we wait to hear about it. But then, yeah, there's a, there's a layer that's missing and I very much related to you in, in that, um, you know, I just, I just think there's a, the internet has become, you know, almost like a marketplace for what TV channels used to be. Like it used to be your media was newspaper, television, and, you know, that has now become really democratised. Like anybody can 
have a viewpoint now if you want to make a channel, if you want to make a podcast. Um, I think it's a fascinating space. I think really for, for Australian footy, it's re- really only – it's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, um, you know, I've yeah seen, no, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I've seen you know in, in the UK, and it is obviously different with, with soccer because it's a global sport with a much larger audience. But the passion that they have for their club, that tribal – passion is not so different to what we have for Carlton and, you know, other supporters for their, um, for their, for their club. So I, I think there's, there's a new, I don't know if it's an industry, but I think fan media is, is a space that's only going to get bigger and bigger. Um, and I think also, mate, if you're doing it, if you're doing it because you really want to, you're more likely to, to have more passion about it. Like yeah. we're not being forced to do this. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's off our own back. Um, you know, with myself, I, I might have a break for for a period of time if I've, if I'm not in the mood to do it, or I just don't have, you know, the passion to be doing it at that particular time. So it, it's completely up to me, you know, the way what I want to put into it. But when I when I do decide to do something, it, it's with you know, it's 110. percent It's not just something I feel like I need to do. And sometimes we're in when you're in. I mean, I've worked in the in the footy media now for 15 years, and um, and it's only a, a part time role, but. Sometimes when you're you're getting paid to do something and and you're doing it all the time, it, it, it becomes like a you know it become it's a chore. Sometimes it becomes a chore, um, and, and and you know you sense sometimes when someone's getting a little bit flat or a little bit tired of their job. This isn't a job for I mean this isn't a job for me. This you know the YouTube channel and it's probably not even a you probably don't even consider it a job for you, mate. It's it's a it's it's a passion, you know, and it's something that you thoroughly enjoy doing and and watching your material i just every time i, I see you um you know and your content it's something you want to do you know like yeah. it's not like you're on there like oh geez i'm doing this again you yeah. know your your enthusiasm for what you're doing you know is it, it comes through and i just think that's really important as well yeah 100 percent. I, I think when for me it was you know when you when you broke it down and if you said to me hey if i could give you unlimited time money if that wasn't an issue like what would you do like the thing that lights me on fire the most when i'm at my most happiest is that two and a half three hours at the game or watching oh, the game yeah. and yeah. you know those couple of hours after that is that is my that's the happiest i am on a week-to-week yeah. week basis even when we're losing you know because it's a well, it's a vet well because i don't think yeah and this is the beauty about us at the moment the situation with carlton and carlton fans and i spoke to you about this last year it's almost like you can feel this, feel this sort of presence amongst the supporters, and and it's it's a pity we didn't get this season properly underway um, with with crowds because I sense late late last year that particularly the supporters were really you could you could it was like an eruption, it was like a it was like a vo- volcano just about to erupt. The the Carlton supporters have been sort of down for so long and have been beaten and, and battered and it was their time to, to start. I mean, the, the St Kilda game was perfect example of that. Um, I've never heard, you know, that level of passion and excitement from Carlton probably, supporters probably since the, the 2013 elimination final, which was something out of the box. Um, it was such a weird afternoon because we probably shouldn't have been there and, and the fact that we spoiled Richmond's party on that occasion, and I've never heard anything quite like that. But... That St Kilda game last year, and even the, the second half against Brisbane when Teague took over, like you could feel, you could feel this release from the Carlton supporters, and 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 I think that the players sense that as well. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic when it starts again in fourteen days' time because there's not going to be that there. There's not going to be the players aren't going to hear that. You know, they're playing against a team like Melbourne who traditionally don't have great support following into a ground like Marvel Stadium. And that could have been a real advantage to us to pack that joint out with our supporters and really intimidate Melbourne, but it's not going to happen. So it's a really level playing field as far as atmosphere goes. I know they don't particularly like playing at that ground, Melbourne, um, and it's not our best ground to play at. Although we had a couple of good wins there last year, I thought we probably played our best footy there against the Western Bulldogs um, at that ground last year. So hopefully we're improving. But as far as an intimidation factor go, there's it, you wouldn't say we've got any advantage in terms of a home ground when we play the Ds there Saturday week at all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was looking, and again, I don't know how relative it is, but um, I'm sort of trying to look for trends in the other sports that have opened. And 
obviously the Bundesliga has started up and I think there's 22 games that they've played so far and I think the home team has won three out of those 22. Now, whether that's relevant to us and footy, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of trying to make the case to go to Geelong and beat Geelong with um, well, not having to worry about the crowd. Well, that's interesting in itself because the last, it wasn't that it was only two games that we two games away that we played there. I mean, it yep. was round round 22 last year, and um, we played them in that final home and away season and got our pants pulled down. It was so one way traffic, particularly in that first half. And um, and I know it was the last game of the year, but it was such a disappointing finish to the season and we get to go back there virtually you know like not that long after and to yep. see to see whether there is any because I, I was there i actually worked that game and and geelong supporters as much as um i think there was an interesting um comment made by i think it was sam mitchell um saying that he he believes that geelong are the most passionate supporters i don't know where he gets that from i, I see geelong supporters i don't travel well but they're particularly loud at home at Kidinia Park. And so that I see that as a quite an even playing field for us because we did play fairly good football the year before under Bolton. We made it a real scrap for them. Uh, I don't know if you remember the game, Terry, but yeah. it was probably one of our better performances under Bolton. We had our chances late in the game. So, um, yeah, that's, that's going to be an interesting one, the way that plays out as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just disappointing the fact that we were we were coming in terms of the of the supporter base, but we're just not going to be able to be there. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean, there's two points I want to touch on. Um, the first one was uh, that's right. So round one, you were one of I don't know I don't know how many people were at round one uh, at the ground. I think maybe a hundred if you include the players yeah. and whatnot. You were actually yeah. there in, in the bubble yeah. working on the night. I want to know from your point of view what was that like? What were your observations there? Because that's fascinating. Yeah, well, I went to the, I worked at that game, so that was the opening game of the year, and then I worked on the Friday night as well at Marvel um, right. for the Bulldogs, the Bulldogs Collingwood game. But I must say, because I've been asked this question a lot, um, what it was like. Um, it per, look as far as I, I can look back in twenty years time and go, well, I worked at that opening round, um, you know, and it was really weird and, and strange. It it wasn't the same, mate. Um, the thing. And don't get me wrong here, because I think it may be a little bit different in a couple of weeks' time when we re resume the season. But there was a sense at that time that that was the only round we were going to get in. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a real, I don't know, there was a real uneasiness about being there, mate. You know, like it was, um, there was de definitely no atmosphere. And I'm a, I'm a game day experience type of guy, even when I'm walking getting out of the car at the MCG, walking across the concourse, seeing all the supporters come in, going up, you know, the escalator to where I work and it's seeing the people dining and then, I mean, and, the, you know, the smells and the noise and the gradual crowd build up. Um, that's part of football. And being at the game for that opening round, it was, yeah, look, it wasn't a great experience. Um, and it was almost a, a sense that, almost relief when, when the AFL did postpone it because I don't think... I want it to come. I want it to come back then, but it was a part of me saying this isn't the right decision we made here, and it felt like that being at the game. It really did. It just didn't felt feel like we we should have been there. Yeah, it you was know, like a guilty got, pleasure. It was a guilty pleasure, mate. You know, and and imagine we actually K Rock did the um, uh, what was the last game of that round? It was the there was a Melbourne played West Coast, didn't they, over in the West? Yeah. And they'd already known at that stage that the season wasn't going to go ahead. Was that correct? I think they announced it. Yeah, I think I feel like they announced it half time of the doggies game, the doggies North Melbourne game at Marvel, and then they so they announced now the doggy. Then... No, the dog the doggies played on the Friday night. I think oh, no. there was a Brisbane Hawthorne at the MCG on the Sunday. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Sorry, and, that's and, and and K Rock, we were calling that game, but I wasn't there, and they found out calling the game at half-time that the season was postponed. So I just call the second half knowing that that was, you know, that was done and dusted. So it just didn't feel right. And then the announcement was made. And I don't know about you, mate, but oh, it was such a weird time. And all you really cared about at that time was, you know, looking after your family, looking after yourself, going into lockdown, doing all the right things. And football became, to for me, the furthest thing from my mind. And, as it went on, after two or three weeks, I was actually enjoyed. I actually really enjoyed the downtime. 
Mm-hmm. Um, getting away from it because it's such a busy time of year. But then when they made the announcement and that we were coming back, I think we're ready to come back now. We've done such a good job of, of flattening the curve. We are ready to come back now. It's just a little bit disappointing. We're not going to have crowds there. But I think the atmosphere is going to be different because we want it now when we're ready to have it back. And, and pretty much everyone's pretty positive about being back as well. There's still a few people saying, oh, you know, they should have cancelled the season. But that... That sort of talk is just ridiculous. The season yeah. needs to go. It needs to go ahead. I yeah, mean, I, to- I totally agree. It needs to go ahead, regardless of whether supporters can can go or not. So, yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I, I gather you're going to look forward to it. You know, hopefully, you know, pubs and bars can open and people can go watch it. And hopefully, at the back end of the season, there'll be opportunities for fans to go to games. Yep, for sure. I want to touch on um, the other point, which was, you know, and, and you're right, the break was, it was bittersweet. I mean, for me personally, I, I you know, came back home to really give the season a crack and go yeah, to the game yeah. and all of that. So it was a little bit sad in that sense. Um, but I do believe, you know, you, you've always got two choices um, with situations. You can either you know, sort of dwell on them and, and be sad and upset, or you could sort of try and find some sort of positivity and optimism through it. I mean, I think obviously with, with round one, what was it? Three of our best four forwards weren't there. Um, yeah. You know, we get Harry back, we get Eddie back. Um, we get, uh, I'm missing one name here, but um, the break for me has been, has been a positive in the night. Harry is now what we believe to be a hundred percent fit. Um, and Mitch, that was the other one. Mitch, well, he wasn't injured in round one, but he spoke about the need to sort of, get back up to speed and not be behind the eight ball. Um, I, I guess they're unproven for me, this forward line so far. Yeah. And I sort of want to get your take on where are we at and uh, when do we stop talking about the second half of last year and start talking about winning games of football properly? Yeah, look, so, my, my, so as far as going back to last year, right, the second half of the season was what we should have been sort of doing in the first half of the season. So I thought we were ready to be playing that type of football at the start of the season under Bolton. So I see the first half of this last season as a complete waste, a complete waste of half a year. If we could have, you know, somehow manufactured six wins in that first half of the season, we know, games that we dropped and games where we just didn't come to play at all, um, that, you know, we could have clocked up 12, 13 wins and been knocking on the door of playing finals. So that's... For me, that's where we should be at. We -hmm. should be in contention to be playing finals. Now, the proof is in the pudding whether we're actually ready to do that. Um, So I thought, you know, and I I think we've forgotten because of these eight, nine weeks that we had a really poor preseason. Our Mm. our practice game form was really poor. The game over in the West, and I know it's practice games, but it wasn't a good showing against the Dockers over there. Um, and then the game against Brisbane at Icon in the second practice game was pretty poor as well. We, we started off okay, but they completely dominated half time. And then we go into round one and, and our opening quarter was as bad as, as bad as football as we've seen for a yep. long time. And it was, it was Bolton, and no disrespect to Brendan Bolton, but that was Bolton-like from last year. Yep. Um, and then we, we gradually work our way back into the game, but then there's the perception, did Richmond take their foot off the break or did we play better football? And so this, and, uh, there's so many unknowns with this football team at the moment. So what I, the expectation is for me, and I think we're in week five, oh, sorry, uh, year five or six of the rebuild, is we should be now, I think, playing finals, bottom parts of the eight, definitely in contention and winning winning more games than we lose. But whether <laughs> my concern is whether we're actually ready to start doing that um, on what we've seen so far, mate, because um, it's only a, a small sample size under David Teague so far, and he's a relatively new coach. I was looking at the the dates. He's, he hasn't even been in the job for 12 months yet. I mean, we, at this time last year, we were getting you know, pants pulled down each week um, in that really horrible period under Brendan Bolton. And, and T, he really hasn't been in the job that that long. So I'm expecting the club to take this huge, big leap, but they've got pretty, essentially a brand-new coach yeah. who's probably trying brand-new things. And now what happens is we we lose some assistant coaches. We use, lose some development because we were 
starting to pump so many resources in development. So how does that, what sort of impact does that have on a, on a youngish group? Because we've invested so heavily in the draft, you know, like, you know, even, you know, even the, the 2015 draft, them players are still developing. Um, and we've lost a core of assistant coaches. So that, the impact there. So to answer your question, I, I we should be winning more games than we lose. If we can't break even in this first little four batches of at least two wins out of the four, yeah. we're in some serious we're in some serious trouble. And I'm I'm a cynic because we've yet to prove anything, mate. Other than other than say a Patrick Cripps and, and their youngest player virtually on the list and Sam Walsh, we don't have a level of consistency from our playing group. It's it's I call it all duck or no dinner at times. And the, and when you look at our losses, our bad losses, um we carry so many passengers. And a lot of those passengers we carry are, are, are the kids that we've invested high draft picks on. You know, your Paddy Gows, your Lockie O'Briens, um, Zach Fisher had a, had a pretty ordinary year last year. Uh, David Cunningham, you know, like he hasn't quite come on yet. And I know his body hasn't, you know, sort of allowed him to do it. But, you know, he signed a three-year contract, which surprised a lot of us. So, and even Harry... Um, Charlie can't get on the park. So all these these draft picks that we've and, and that we've invested in over the last five years, which we all wanted, they get to other than really Sam Walsh in his first year. None of them, and, and now Weedering starting to show why he was taken at none. None of them have been consistent, yep. and that comes from being young. But at the same time, are you confident in saying that Paddy Dow is going to be a, a two hundred game player for Carlton Football Club? It's a lot harder to say it now than what it was in year one. Were you confident that Sam Walsh would be played at 200 games? Very much so, yeah. Would you Would you be confident that, um, and it's a pick, what was uh, Paddy Dow, pick three? Pick three. Would you, would you be confident in saying that he's going to play, say, 200 quality games for the car? I'd say no. Yeah, not, not confidently. I've seen. Yeah, no, not confidently. Uh, same with Lockie O'Brien as a pick 10. I'm not confident in saying that he's going to be 150, 200 quality game player for Carlton Football Club. Like, they've shown little signs. Um, can SBS take the next? I mean, don't get me wrong, but this this is the... the, the we, can, we can all say that, wow, we've got a wonderfully talented group, but I'm yet to be convinced that we've got the right makeup to make that significant jump. And they've got to prove that to me first, because the only one that's really proved it to me is, is Patrick Cripps. And the rest need to not get to his level because that's completely impossible. What they need to get to is a level of consistency um, to make us a good football team. Um, and it makes me nervous, mate. It makes me nervous because I see those types of performances against Richmond and they are the benchmark. But that's where we need to get to. But it's not about it's not about getting there one year and doing what Melbourne did and then falling the next year, like they made a prelim final and could have made a grand final Melbourne, but they got pumped in the West, but they finished second last last year. We want to get there. I think this time now, mate, and I think we all want, once we get there this time, we want to stay there. And that doesn't necessarily mean we win two grand finals in three years or we have a little dynasty of grand finals. That'd be fantastic. But what we want is to be in a situation where we're in, we're in contention every year and give ourselves a possibility. We're playing finals on a regular basis. We don't drop, you know, and, and finish second last on the ladder or, or wooden spoons or in the bottom four. We're like a – so my my idea world would to be like a Geelong, Richmond, um, and this is difficult, a Hawthorne, uh, West Coast, all those teams that they get up there and they stay there, they might drop to the – bottom rungs of the ladder and they may miss the finals for one year but they're straight back in because they've got a model that works and yep. could you say could you say say six years ago that Richmond would be where they are today yeah absolutely not <laughs> and what what works for them what works what has worked for them it's about what they've done off the field it's not so much what they've done on the field which has been marvelous don't get me wrong but they got their act together off the field they got a wonderful president, uh, magnificent uh, Neil Baum coming in, uh, football manager, um, and Brendan Gale's probably the best CEO in the in the in the in the caper. Um, so they were stable at board level, stable from an administrative administrative point of view, and then that 
just infiltrated into the playing group and they came so professional. Um, and they and they backed their coach, Damien Hardwick. They saw that he that he was the right man and they trusted him and backed him. Uh, whereas we, we we seem to be a bit flippant, mate. We 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 go after the coach if they're not you know if they're not giving us results. So the the, the pressure is on David Teague. He needs to start winning more games than we lose. And and there's, there are small little areas of concerns. I mean, my last video was about our starts. You know, yep. our starts under David Teague have been atrocious. And I don't know how many Those times Those stats Terry... that you pulled up in this, at, the, at the beginning of that video, the, the stats that you pulled up, I think it was over the last 12 games or, or David Teague's reign. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was 21 goals in the rear. 21 goals in the rear in first quarters. And it, it stemmed from the first game against Brisbane, um, and then it's the last game against Richmond. They kicked 7-2 in the first quarter. And three of those, they, three of those games have been held goalless. So Is that I, it's, mental? It's not, is that mental or is it – like, what is that? It has to be mental in my opinion. And this is where, this is where questions need to be uh, – this is where I'm not convinced yet because I, I don't know whether it's – whether these guys are still young and immature so that I – know how to switch on for a game and they're, and they're almost standing back waiting for the senior guys and we haven't got a lot of quality senior and obviously Doc not being there the last two years. But it's almost like if Cripple, Cripple will get us going, Cripple will do it. He'll, he'll dominate out of the centre, he'll burst through a few packs, he'll get us going. So the, and we, to me, we've got introverts. We need to have introverted guys like Paddy Dow, Lockie O'Brien, even guys like SBS, they sort of a bit quieter, so they wait and they don't get involved early. And that, that to me, I, I I see that as the problem. Mm-hmm. And if I'm an opposition coach, I'm putting all my all my work into Patrick Cripps. Yeah, because I know history says with his Carlton team, if you can stop Patrick Cripps, stop it at the source. You're going to go a long way to, to stopping the others get involved until we had that next group take more responsibility. And I'm sure they're addressing this um, or trying to address it. Then I I don't know. I, I, that's the reason why I think we're starting so poorly. But those stats don't lie, mate. I mean, no. if, if, you're not going to win every first quarter, but there's something essentially wrong when you're on the back foot consistently like we've been. And sometimes it's easier. I, I often used to hear Gary Lyon talk about this with Melbourne uh, when they were going through similar problems. Sometimes when you're, um, as a footballer, if you're not, um, you don't like to get on the front foot, it's easier to chase. Yep. When the pressure's off at half time, you're down by six goals, you come in, the pressure's off, you can then, you can then sort of relax a little bit, then it's easier to chase. It's actually harder to come out sort of fired up, and that's what he was saying about Melbourne. And you don't like to use the the term like weak or soft because they're not. It's more to do with personality mm-hmm. um, and 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 makeup of personality. And and Mick Moldhouse used to say it all the time. Carlton were a, a team of introverts, mm-hmm. and I still think we recruit introverts. Yes, quietish type, point. you know, quietish type players. Um, who showed the most aggression in that opening round of the year? Who was the only guy that flew the flag and got a 50-metre penalty given against him? It was Sam Doherty. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we didn't like what he did, but at the same time, when was the last time you saw, you know, and, and I love Mark Murphy, but when was the last time you saw Mark Murphy get in an opposition player's grill? You know, like well, a trick concert does. You know, one well, of the moments in that first quarter that really, and it was a little moment, but for me it was symbolic. Uh, it was, I think it was the third quarter. Dusty had just ragged old Murph, threw him to the ground like mm-hmm. he was a rag doll. And nobody came around, nobody flew the flag. And I don't know if it's maybe an old school principle that's getting thrown out the window, but for me, it's very important that you have that um, no fear, that, 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 that fearless approach to the opposition. And if someone throws around what should be uh, a club legend or a club champion like Murph is to these boys, uh, that was symbolic for me that nobody really got around Dusty. Yeah, well, and this is why this is why I'm desperate for um, two players in particular to develop pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so one is Tom Williamson, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's within the club. He, he's highly ra- uh, rated as being really aggressive um, and doesn't take any shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got that bit of. Um, you pr- probably wouldn't notice it from um, from any interviews or anything, but he's got a bit of swagger about him as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually, when I'm sitting behind the goals at training once, I heard a couple of assistant coaches saying something about him being a bit not loose, but just a bit out there. So, mm-hmm. and you you saw him his when he played that first year, Tom Williams. He got stuck in a, a, to Mills from Sydney and mm-hmm. really put him off his game. It was fantastic. And the other one's Liam Stocker. Mm-hmm. And I reckon he's got some real prick in him as well. So these are, and I think he's a bit of an extrovert as well, um, Liam Stocker. Um, in terms of, and I'm not talking about a guy who piss farts around and is loud. I'm talking about extroverted in the way they play their football. Yep. Uh, so like a Wayne, like a Wayne Johnston was in the in the in the eighties for Carlton. They played with a real presence and a real attitude. Um, and and I would like to see more of that from our players. At times, I just think where even someone like Jacob Wiedering is too nice. Yeah. Uh, and and can we can we get that out of them? Is there some way we can get? Is that just a natural sort of organic sort of thing that they have to find them that they've got in them, but it, they just haven't been able. But I I think you've either got it or you haven't. Yeah. Um, in that regard, and someone like Liam Stocker, he's got some confidence about him, but. Can he play, though? That's the thing. Can he play? You know, can we haven't play. seen it yet. Can yep. he play? No, I don't know if he can. You know, everyone's going, like, you read comments like, oh, he's going to be a great player, this kid. We don't know. We, we just don't know. Don't know. Oh, we've seen seen him play three or four games. He looks okay. He looks, he's got a bit of class. He uses the ball quite well. But we don't know whether he's going to be a, you know, like, we just don't know. We know Sam Walsh is going to be a gun. Um, but other than Sam Walsh, you can't sort of just say, oh, you oh, can't wait to get Stocker in because he's just going to be a gun. We haven't seen it yet. And there's nothing to suggest he's going to be a gun this year because he's actually had a quite a slow preseason. He's done yeah. all the right things, done all the training, but you would have thought his preseason was relatively, it wasn't disappointing, but it wasn't anything to, to write home about. It wasn't like, oh, it's, um, He's jumping out of the box to for put his hand up for round one. He wasn't even in any contention for round one, which I thought Terry was a little bit of a disappointment to think that Same. probably one of the fittest blokes at the you know like he had such a good preseason that I don't think his name came up seriously other than in you know some people in social media said oh where's where's uh, you know where's Stocker at but I don't think it came up in serious consideration for a spot in round one. I don't think he was even in the top 25, no, which is a little I mean, which is a little bit disappointing. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I think Teague had an interview on, I can't remember which, which radio station it was, and it was prior to round one, and they asked him about Stocker, and he was pretty honest about it. He just said, no, he's not in consideration. So when he said that, I, I, it, was, it wasn't a shock to me because obviously he, he didn't start that practice match against Collingwood. And then I think the week after, he didn't play in in WA against Perth. And that's right. when I sort of realised, well, okay, well, he's he's just not there. Like, he's not injured. Because we were watching him during the match scene at training. I didn't see him doing any of the um, the work with the rehab group. Um, whatever it is, it is it is what it is. It, it's, it's interesting being, uh, you know, being a fan because you are sometimes limited in your information. You just yeah. sort of... You either got to make assumptions or read between the lines, you know, because we're not completely on the inside. Well, so it's just a matter of being patient, but at the same time with patience, and you don't go, "Oh, he's not going to be any good." But at the same time, you don't sort of. I'm not. I'm never in a position to go, um, "Oh, he's going to be a champion." I mean, I don't know anything about him other than seeing some clips of him playing in the under 18s where he looked good. He showed a little bit of polish when he played the few games he played last year. He didn't look out of place. Um, and there's obviously some ability there. He won a Morris medal. Um, but we don't, we've got no idea where this kid's going to take the next jump. But what we do know, he's got some aggression and he's got some yep. attitude, which we lack. So that that quality is something we lack. But can he play? You know what I mean? Um, so that that's the big question for me is is can he take a take a step? And when you're when you're Liam Stocker, you would have thought a good preseason. Oh, I'm knocking on the door of playing senior footy. But there's a kid in his first year, Sam Phil, just straight in, you know, plays the practice games, straight in front of you, you know what I mean? So um, he's got a bit of work to do, and um, I'm sure I'm sure he'll be okay, but 
Um, you know, he's only young, but we just don't know with some of these guys. I haven't seen enough of, of Lockie O'Brien, and I said Paddy Dow before, to say that they're going to make us a really good side. And that's what we need, Fisher and the, these types of players to make us a really good side. And, and yeah, we've just got to be patient. Uh, but at the same time, we should be at a level now where we're winning more games than we're losing. We yeah. should be. One final one for you before I let you go. Uh, I get everyone to make this prediction and we, we're going to look back on it. You know, this is a little memory for you and I to look back on in, in years yeah. to come. Can you give me the year that you believe we're going to win the flag? Oh, good question. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go... Um, so Crippers 25, 24, 25 now. Yep. Um, I reckon he 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 will be 29 when we win our first flag. So what that makes is 224. Yep. Uh, well, not that, the next flag. Um, I just... I just think there's a lot of good sides around at the moment. I think Richmond and, and West Coast are going to be in the frame over the next couple of years, and um, it might be a little bit longer for us. Uh, and I, I, I hope we make that transition now into finals, but I don't think it's going to be for another four or five years, unfortunately. <laughs> no, that's fair <laughs> enough. No. You've bought yourself some time, which is good. I know, yeah. <laughs> I'm being very conservative, mate. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, um, listen, mate, it's been it's been a great chat. Thank you so much for your time. And no, um, anytime, obviously, anytime. I remember when you started um, started your YouTube channel. I remember it was in honour of your dad, and I think yeah. you've made him extremely proud. And um, you know, good luck with it all. And you know, we'll be in touch. I'll see you hopefully at some point, either at training or at a game, and uh, we can knock back a couple. Yeah, good on you, Terry. Thanks for having me, buddy. I'll I'll speak to you soon. Go Blues, mate. Cheese, mate.